Welcome to episode 20 of Sugidama podcast, the podcast about Japanese sake, the drink which is known for its purity and was initially used in religious ceremonies. And talking about purity, what could be purer than Junmaishu, which is translated as pure rice sake, or probably Honjozo, translated as true brew? Well, we'll see. But first, let me tell you about our sponsor, London Sake, who have one of the widest selections of premium and craft sake available online today. You can choose from over 100 sake from 25 breweries, and they will deliver across the UK and many European markets. And if you don't know what sake to choose, you can use simple online tasting notes, together with very sensible and affordable food pairings to help you decide. What's more, you can get a 10% discount by just using the code SUGIDAMA, all caps, during checkout. London Sake, making sake simple. My name is Alex, and I live in London. I am a certified sake specialist, sake judge, sake educator, and sake advocate. Besides this podcast, I write on SUGIDAMA blog about all things sake, publish tasting notes, overviews and information about sake events happening in London. Recently, I have spoken to one of my listeners who praised this podcast for its wonderful content. But you know, he said, sake is a completely new thing for me, and I feel a bit overwhelmed with the amount of information you put in each episode. Why don't you make them a bit easier to digest? And he's absolutely right. I think I did some information overload, talking about brewing techniques, sake terms, historic context, and a lot of other things in a very short period of time. I actually was listening to another drink podcast and felt exactly the same despite the fact I had some prior knowledge of the subject. So I decided to do a series of episodes, each of them focusing on one particular topic I have mentioned before. This season, I will highlight Junmai Honjozo in this episode, Ginjo Style in the next one, and Nigori and Namazaki in the following two episodes. In the next season, I will probably focus on production aspects and methods. So today we will talk about Junmai and Honjozo, which for some people are two opposite sides of sake. The reason I'm going debate about whether one is better than the other, and I will touch upon it. But first, let's talk about Junmai. Junmai literally means pure rice, and Junmai Sake or Junmai Shu is defined as Sake made of only four ingredients – rice, water, koji and yeast. However, there are a few other things that still go into Sake like lactic acid in the case of the Sokuchu method, charcoal or sometimes gelatin for filtration. Though my understanding is that not many brewers use gelatin uh, nowadays. In the case of filtration, only traces of charcoal should remain after the sake is filtered. That's the point of filtration anyway. There is no milling ratio criteria in Junmai, so theoretically it can be from 100% meaning unpolished rice, up to 60% and even higher. Though technically, milling beyond 60% will produce Junmai Ginjo and Dai Ginjo. The term Junmai is very new and only emerged in the 1970s. But the history of sake made only from rice, water, koji and yeast goes back in centuries. In a way, all sake made before the Edo period were Junmai. But let's look at the sake brewing process again. We know that koji, aspergillus orizae, a microorganism responsible for a plethora of Asian and Japanese foods like soy sauce, miso, pickles, sake, shochu, and so on, 
was introduced to Japan, probably from China, somewhere in the 4th century. The first record of using it in sake making goes back to the Nara period in the 8th century, what we can call a birth of the modern sake brewing. So how has it worked for the last 12 centuries? The rice was steamed and inoculated with koji. Looking for water, koji penetrates a rice grain, converting starch into sugar in the process. For centuries, sake breweries were using so-called ambient yeast, the yeast from the air and surroundings. This yeast was landing on the sugary mash created by koji and was converting the sugar into alcohol and CO2, while koji was making more sugar from starch. So this is the process called, if you remember, a multiple parallel fermentation, the key to sake brewing. The sugar is supplied to the yeast um, by koji in a very efficient way, resulting in the highest alcohol content in naturally fermented alcoholic beverages. You remember that sake can be brewed up to 22%. If you want to learn more about koji but haven't listened to episode 16, please do. In that episode, I'm talking to Akemi Yokoyama, a koji specialist about everything koji. So technically, for hundreds of years, sake brewers knowingly used three main ingredients for making sake – water, rice and koji. The two remaining ones, yeast and lactic acid, were coming from the air without any intervention from the brewers. And it was the only method of making this beautiful drink. <laughs> Things changed during the Edda period, when brewers realized that they can add distilled alcohol into maromi, the fermenting sake mash, just before pressing to prevent accidental spoilage of the product. Also, they found out that alcohol makes sake more aromatic, and I'm sure they didn't know this. It draws components responsible for the aromas from maromi and keeps them in the final product. The alcohol also dilutes the acidity and amino acids, which makes the flavor lighter and the sake smoother and easier to drink. Domo Shuzoki, a book published in 1685, and which Brian Ashcraft, in his excellent sake bible, cleverly translated as sake making for dummies, described the technique of adding alcohol into maromi and also how to make the proper shochu to use as distilled alcohol. While Huzudenkiroku, published in 1771, also describes how adding alcohol improved the sake, made it more stable and drier. The National Research Institute of Brewing which Natsuki mentioned in her interview in episode 11, has actually verified and extended this conclusion. I'm not sure how widespread was the practice, but given that distilled alcohol at that time in Japan was likely pricey, most sake were probably still brewed with the traditional method. At least all sources I have researched pointed to the fact that all sake made before the 1940s had only four ingredients – sake, water, koji and yeast, as specified by the law. Things really changed during the Second World War, when the rice shortage forced the government to order sake breweries across the country to add alcohol in their brew to a. save rice and b. increase the yield. The practice continued after the war. And for some time, all sake made in Japan had alcohol added. It was a good business for breweries, as distilled alcohol by that time was cheap and the yields were high. You might think that return to a more traditional brewing style without adding alcohol should have been on the cards as soon as the rice rationing was over after the war, as a quite logical and normal step. But it was not. Moreover, the first attempts to get back to non-alcohol added sake was pretty controversial. First, economically, breweries didn't have much incentive to do it. You could make excellent first grade sake and adding alcohol kept your costs low. I guess that as people became more well off during the post-war economic boom, they started paying more attention to what they drank. 
A lot of sake made this time had not only distilled alcohol, but also glucose and amino acids to improve the taste, and these things gave people nasty hangovers. Not every brewer wanted to be associated with these side effects. So, the first brewery which started making additive-free sake was Tamano Hikari in the Fushimi area in Kyoto. And I actually visited this brewery in 2019, just before Covid. It was a very interesting visit. But back to Junmai. Um, this time the term Junmai Shu just didn't exist. So the brewery called it Motenka Shu, additive-free sake in English. The first Motenka Shu went on sale in 1964, the year of Tokyo Olympics, and it became very controversial in the sake industry. You see, Many breweries took the name as offense, as it implied that time that all other breweries were adding some stuff in their sake. Initially, Japanese drinkers also didn't get mutenkashu. It was more expensive, but classified as grade 2. So it didn't work as a gift, which was one of the popular use of sake. How can you give someone a grade 2 sake? Very rude. There are more details about it in Brian Ashcraft's Sake Bible book I have mentioned before, so if you don't have it, I recommend you to buy and read it. It's full of very interesting stuff. Anyway, while the public was not too keen on additive-free sake, other breweries started to follow the suit and release Mutenkoshu. Chiyo Sono in 1968 and Kamuizumi in 1972, to name a few. In 1972, a pure sake association was founded, and the name Junmaishu, a pure rice sake, was adopted. Nowadays, many breweries make only Junmai sake, and overall it accounts roughly for a quarter of the market. So, this is a story of Junmai sake. Before we talk about major differences between Junmai and non-Junmai sake, and whether one is better than the other, let me remind you about London Sake, our sponsor, and their huge selection of curated sake sets, which provide a great opportunity to explore various styles and types of sake, like Junmai or non-Junmai, for example. Have a look, but don't forget about the magic word, SUGIDAMA, all caps, to get you 10% discount. I'm not going to talk about super premium Junmai, like Junmai Ginjo and Dai Ginjo. It's a topic of a future episode. Today we will focus on just Junmai Sake and its alcohol added counterparty, Honjozo. First of all, the whole terminology only emerged in the 1970s, 1990s, and it is a part of the Tokutei Meisho, or so called special designation Sake. The term Honjozo means true brew or brewing by the books. I think probably because the technique of adding alcohol was pretty standard at that time. On the other hand, Honjozo sake doesn't have any other additives. Now let's take a look at the key characteristics of Junmai and Honjozo in terms of aroma, taste and food pairing. In simple terms, Junmai sake is usually not very aromatic and quite savory. When you smell Junmai sake, you won't notice this strong fruity or floral aroma usually associated with Ginjo style. Junmai sake normally has a reserved character. Very often you will notice such smells as steamed rice, yeast, yogurt, mushroom, asparagus, even non-food aromas like stone, timber. I don't know, even sometimes asphalt or tatami, depending on sake. You still might have some fruity notes like apple or plum, but not very prominent. Overall, the aroma might be simple and delicate, while the complexity would come from non-fruity or non-floral components. Now, let's taste our generic Junmai sake. What I mean by savory taste is a very significant umami component. And again, umami is what makes a steak or ripe tomato so delicious. Junmai sake could be quite sweet compared to other styles. However, it's not a fruity sweetness, more like food sweetness, 
you know, which you will find in, for example, spaghetti bolognese, beef stew, or mushroom risotto. But of course, there is dry junmai sake. Again, the sweetness in sake is a complex matter and depends not only on the sugar content, but also the acidity, which often offsets it quite significantly. So junmai might feel a bit heavy due to the high umami, but it's what makes it the essential food sake. More often than not, you will enjoy junmai sake primarily with food rather than on its own. It's amazing sake to accompany any comfort food, not necessarily from Japanese cuisine. The dishes I have just mentioned will be perfect with junmai, also beef bourguignon, chili con carne, fried chicken, salmon teriyaki. I've mentioned that the London Sake website provides food pairing suggestions for their sake. So I have taken a look and this is what dishes are often recommended with junmai sake there. Fish and chips, mushroom pizza, ribeye steak, yakitori, cheeseburger and fries, roast beef, barbecue, prawns, sausage and mash, stew, grilled meats, even baklava. You've got a picture. Junmai sake is amazing at any temperature, but very often blossoms at room temperature or hot. And it's so good to have it warmed up with hot food. So fulfilling. So my advice, try it at room temperature or at 30-45 degrees of Celsius and decide for yourself. It's good chilled, but a lot of nuances will only become noticeable when it's warmer. So experiment. You can either go up, as I do, take a bottle from the fridge and don't put it back. Pour a bit of sake in a tokkuri, a ceramic sake flask. So the first drink will be chilled and then the sake will start warming up. After a while, you can warm it up by putting the tokkuri in the hot water. Alternatively, as Andrew Russell suggested in the previous episode, you can warm it up first and it will drop to room temperature while you drink it. Then you can take a bottle with the remaining sake from the fridge and try it chilled and see what is your perfect temperature for this particular sake. Now let's look at Honjoza. First of all, it's also a special designation or premium sake. Opposite to Junmai, it has a polishing ratio criteria. It must be at least 70% milling ratio. It could be 60 or slightly higher, but in this case it's usually called Tokubetsu Honjozo or Special Honjozo. There are a number of reasons why brewers don't want to classify their sake as ginjo, from the style to some marketing considerations. As I said before, Honjozo sake is usually more aromatic, lighter and drier compared to Junmai. Again, it's not as aromatic as any ginger style sake, but you will often notice some herbal notes like mint or grass, green apple, melon, asparagus, peas, roasted or steamed rice, even coffee or chocolate. Honjoza tastes also savory, but less than Junmai. It's high in umami due to its relatively low polishing ratio. But the alcohol added at the end of the fermentation takes a bit of this savoriness away. It's great food sake, but it's drier and lighter, so it plays a bit differently with food compared to Junmai. It's pretty good with uh, spicy food, pizza, barbecue, grilled fish, mushroom dishes. London sake suggestions also include steak, ramen, Thai red curry, calamari, katsu sando, and snacks. Many Honjoza sake can be enjoyed on their own or with a bit of cheese or cured meats. You can also experiment with temperatures. Usually it's great between chilled to room temperature. But some Honjoza sake are superb warm or even hot. Quite often people ask if Chunma is better than Honjoza given its more natural brewing method or just prefer Junmai to Honjozo on the basis that adding alcohol is wrong and destroys the purity of sake. I absolutely disagree with it. For me, it's just a different style. There is nothing wrong with the addition of a bit of alcohol, usually less than 10% of the weight of the rice used. The Honjozo sake is normally still diluted 
before bottling to bring the ABV down to the usual 15-16%. If a master brewer would like to make a nice, inexpensive and light sake, Honjozi is the way to go. Unfortunately, Honjozi sake was negatively affected by two trends. The overall decline in sake sales in Japan and the switch to Junmai in terms of preferences of the drinkers. You can see that the sales of Junmai sake are rising, while the sales of alcohol added styles are in strong decline. But you should choose sake on the basis of its taste and style rather than on some ideological grounds like the one pure and this one is not. Think about the food you would like to have with it, uh, the occasion and so on, and make your choice. You should drink sake because you enjoy it, not because it's brewed using a certain method. As we talked about Junmai and Honjoza, I decided to feature two sake of the episode. They are from the same brewery, Urakasumi, and even look pretty similar. One is Honjoza, called Urakasumi Honjikomi Honjoza, and another is Junmai, called Urakasumi Misty Bay Junmai. Both are terrific sake, and both are usually priced around 30 quid. The Urakasumi brewery is located in the Miyagi prefecture, which capital, Sendai, is a quite popular tourist destination. I hope to go there when the travel restrictions are finally lifted. I met the 13th generation president of the brewery, Saurasan, a few times, so probably I will visit the brewery at some point. The brewery is quite old, founded in 1724, almost 300 years ago, in Shogama. The name of the brewery means Misty Bay, and refers to Matsushima Bay, which the brewery faces. So let's start with Urakasumi Honjoza. Polish to 65%, it has SMV, the second meter value, plus 2, and the acidity 1.5, which indicates medium dryness, and it's true. The sake has a very faint and delicate aroma, with citrus, lemon, steamed rice, green apple, strawberry, apricot and toasted almonds notes. It's a medium-bodied, medium-dry sake, with a nice oily texture and with a short but smooth and clean finish. Urakasumi Honjozo is very versatile in terms of food pairing. I had it with fajitas the first time and then with sardine donburi and it was great. It offsets the spiciness of fajitas and the oiliness of sardines, and was super enjoyable. And it doesn't have an intense aroma or taste, so it complements the food perfectly. Its companion, Urakasumi Junmai, has the same technical characteristics as Honjozo, uh, 65 polishing ratio, plus 2 SMB and 1.5 acidity. I don't have detailed tasting notes, but as far as I remember, the sake has a slightly fruitier aroma and is a bit sweeter than the Honjoza, with more umami in the taste. In terms of food pairing, it will be perfect with burger and chips, barbecue meat or prawns or yakitori, if you want to have a Japanese dish with it. That's it for today. I'll be back with more episodes. In the meantime, Buy Junmai and Honjozo Sake and compare them yourself. You don't have to compare the same brand like Rakasumi. Different breweries should be fine. Any questions or suggestions? You can always drop me a line. My email address is alex at sugidama.co.uk or you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at Sugidama blog in one word. Look at my website sugidama.co.uk I've got a constantly updated tasting notes section and a lot of posts with recommendations, reviews and so on. Urakasumi Junmai is available on the London Sake website and you can get a 10% discount by entering Sugidama, all in caps, at the checkout. They used to have Honjo's as well, so keep checking if you want to buy it. I'm not sure if it's available anywhere. Sake supplies became a bit more hectic due to the pandemic. Hopefully, the situation will improve in the next few months. But you can always buy sake at any other online sake store or pop into a wine shop stocking sake or Japanese supermarket and pick a bottle of Junmai and or Honjoza. 
or go to your local wine shop and ask them why they don't stock sake. Again, if you like the episode and want more, hit the subscribe button. Please, 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 if you want to support Sugidama podcast, leave a review on the Apple podcast or share this podcast with your friends, with anyone who might ask you about sake on your social media, chat apps, anyway. Let's bring the world of sake into the masses. Thanks a lot for listening. Kampai. Sugi, 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 sugi dama blog. Sugi, 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 sugi dama blog.